This lecture will be a brief introduction to unsupervised learning, where we will see some techniques that we can use without uh, that approach that we saw previously of trying to fit the parameters to some uh, so that we can approximate some target values. So we're going to see briefly what uh, unsupervised learning is and what it is for. And we're going to look at uh, two different uh, fields in unsupervised learning, which is uh, dimensionality reduction, basically trying to extract a subset of features from a large number of features that we have in our data. Um, this uh, can be done linearly. There is, uh, we're going to look at principal component analysis as uh, one example. Uh, but also we have nonlinear methods uh, of manifold learning of trying to uh, represent how the data is structured in its original dimension and then approximate that uh, in a lower dimension. Uh, another area of unsupervised learning that we're going to look briefly into is clustering, which is to uh, cluster, group together uh, examples that are similar and try to, to find structure in the data with that approach. So we're going to look at two different clustering algorithms, uh, prototype-based clustering with uh, k-means and density-based clustering with dbSCAN. The idea of unsupervised learning uh, is uh, we can consider it a broad hat where we put everything that we do when we are not considering uh, labeled data. We, we are not considering some target values that we want to approach. So we do not have this uh, uh, possibility of measuring some error, some loss function to try to optimize by comparing predictions with target values. And our goal is to uh, help us understand the data, find some structure in the data. So we can imagine that our unsupervised learner is doing something to the, the features that we are feeding into there and generating new features from there. So creating a different representation of the data. This does not mean that we cannot use unsupervised learning when the data is labeled, because we can simply ignore the labels. And in fact, unsupervised learning is often used as a first step before we go into supervised learning. For example, for selecting features or transforming, extracting new features, basically transforming the representation of the data. But there are some tasks that you can actually do without uh, labels and that help you uh, even if you don't step into the next stage of supervised learning that can help you understand the data and deal with the data. So for example, solving uh, visualization uh, problems, especially in high dimensional data, um, estimating uh, distributions of values, uh, grouping examples together and so on. So here we're going to focus on these two aspects uh, they are often uh, used in bioinformatics. Dimensionality reduction is important because we often deal with data that has a very large number of features, uh, especially in, in genomics and proteomics and so on. Each example can have a huge set of values. Uh, you can imagine things like uh, DNA or, uh, microarrays or uh, sequencing data and so on. If you want to characterize uh, samples using all of the features that you can observe, you can have samples that have uh, a very high dimensionality. And clustering is something that we actually already saw before. Uh, grouping together things that are similar is what we do when we do uh, we compute phylogenetic trees. So phylogenetic trees are an example of hierarchical clustering. Today we're going to look at partitional clustering, which is when we are not trying to find hierarchies, but just uh, uh, dividing the examples into groups. So let's start with dimensionality reduction. Uh, there is a problem when you have to deal with data in high dimensions, not only it's difficult to understand the data visualization and so on, but you can immediately get problems with overfitting if you are trying to do some prediction, classification, something like that. Because if you have a large number of features, we saw previously, our models become increasingly uh, powerful, increasingly more capable of uh, uh, performing in the training set, but they can lose the ability to generalize because there is too, there are too many possibilities for correctly solving any problem that we give it in the training set. Uh, so even if you're using a linear classifier like logistic regression, if your data has a, a very high dimension, you can easily overfit by getting very good results in the training set, but then very poor results outside the training set. So we need to shrink down the data to compress, so to speak, the, the features that we have. 
and the solution would be to reduce the number of dimensions, but importantly, we need to preserve uh, the information we have there. We cannot simply discard figures at random, because then what is left may not be useful. So we're going to start by looking at a, a, a classical statistical technique for doing this, principal component analysis. I'm not going to detail this very much. I'm going to speak uh, to skip a bit the, the mathematics because you will uh, cover this in, in other courses. Uh, but then we're going to move on to some uh, manifold learning techniques that take a, a different approach. So the idea of starting with PCA here is not uh, to focus on PCA, but to give you a notion of the contrast between principal component analysis, which is a, a classical widely used technique, and more recent uh, uh, manifold learning techniques that have some, some improved uh, properties. So the, the idea of uh, principal component analysis is to find a set of perpendicular vectors, uh, an orthogonal base, uh, such that uh, it is aligned with the greatest variance in our data. So the first vector will, will align with the direction where our points are most dispersed. And then the second vector will be perpendicular to the first and aligned to most of the remaining uh, variance, the remaining dispersion, and so on. So we can reduce dimensionality by keeping only the k first vectors and then projecting our data into that uh, orthogonal base so that we retain only the k dimensions that uh, correspond to these directions. Uh, so let's uh, illustrate this with, uh, with some data. You can see this distribution of points in three dimensions, and we can see that they are spread out mostly along this uh, diagonal here. So if we were to project everything along this axis, we would get the majority of the variance in the data. So what we do in, in PCA is that we create this, uh, uh, the scatter matrix. We first compute the, the mean point of our data. This is just the average of all the vectors that we have uh, in our data set. And then we compute the scatter matrix, which will, have, will be a square matrix with a dimension equal to the number of dimensions that we have in our data. So in this case, uh, we, are, we have points in three dimensions. So the scatter matrix will, would be a three by three matrix. And uh, the scatter matrix is computed by computing the, the product of this vector, which is for each point subtracting the mean. So the vector that goes from the center of our cloud to each point, and then multiplying that by the transpose. So if this is a row vector and this is a column vector, the product here will be a, th a, a matrix with a, a square matrix with as many uh, rows and columns as the number of elements in this vector. And we keep adding this for all the vectors, and this will be the, the scatter matrix, which is basically a, a multiple of the covariance matrix. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but just to give you an idea, we do this with all the data that we have, and now we find the, the eigenvectors for this matrix. Uh, the eigenvectors are vectors that, uh, um, when we multiply a matrix by one of its eigenvector, we obtain a vector that is... Uh, aligned with the eigenvector. So it's just a constant multiplied by the eigenvector. So basically, the eigenvectors of a matrix, we can imagine them as the, the directions where the, the matrix uh, merely stretches and uh, does not result in rotations or changes in, in direction. Uh, so if we wanted to do this uh, with, uh, with code, we can do this uh, simply using NumPy. So suppose that we have uh, our data in a, a matrix where each example, each point is one row and uh, uh, the three coordinates are the, the, three co uh, the three columns of the matrix. So basically this data set will be a, a matrix with three columns for the three x, y, z coordinates of the points and one row for each point. If we want to compute the mean point, uh, this uh, m here, all we need to do is to uh, use the numpy mean uh, function on our matrix and specify that we are computing the mean along the first dimension, which is the rows. So it will give you uh, the mean of the first column, the second column, and the third column in a vector. And now we can uh, loop through all the the rows in the uh, in our matrix, 
we can uh, compute the centered vector, which is simply the coordinates of the point minus the mean. And now we, we reshape it so that we have uh, the correct shape in a, in a column here, uh, so that we can do this matrix multiplication of a column by a row, by the transpose, so that we get the, the matrix right. Uh, now, this, uh, this kind of things, at least for me, they are often confusing because I am not sure whether first is a column or first is a row. But if you if you meet these kinds of problems when writing code uh, with algebra with uh, multiplications, you can always experiment and check the result. So, uh, since my my memory of this is often uh, uh, fallible, I usually write a snippet of code just to check. But in this case, this is a uh, get the the centered vector as a column so you use the reshape to have it in three rows and one column and now we can do the uh, dot product between the the matrix multiplication between this vector and the transpose of the vector and you get a transpose of a matrix in uh, um, uh, numpy using this uh, dot t uh, attribute. So this is a matrix of three rows by one column. This will be the matrix of three columns by one row because it's tra transposed. When we do this multiplication, we get the three by three square matrix. And we're going to add that to the original matrix we created here, which was starting at zeros, uh, a three by three matrix. So basically what we are doing this, computing the scatter matrix by summing all of these terms. And now uh, we can look at the scatter matrix. This is the, the result. And we can compute the, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix by using the linear algebra module of NumPy. It has this eig function that you can uh, give a, a matrix like this, and it will return uh, the, the vector with the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are these lambdas here for the corresponding eigenvectors and you get this matrix which has the, the different vectors in column. So this is the first eigenvector, the second eigenvector, and the third. And now we can look at uh, the result here and see what these vectors are in our data. So basically, these are the three vectors that we obtained. Uh, you notice that one of them is aligned with the, the uh, largest variance in the data. So this is the first eigenvector here. And then there are the other two, which are perpendicular. They are all perpendicular to each other. And this is the new base that we uh, uh, could create. So we could now use this base to rotate our data and align the variance of our points with uh, these vectors so that uh, the axis with the largest va variance is aligned with the first vector then the largest uh, direct the direction of the largest remaining variance is aligned with the second and so on but if we were to do this it, this would just be a rotation and we would still have our data in two dimensions in three dimensions sorry what we can do is to uh, reduce this uh, project by using only uh, um, the largest uh, vectors, so the, the, the vectors corresponding to the largest eigenvalues, which are the uh, those that we have, we can see here. So the, the one with the largest eigenvalue is the first one, 183. And then the other two are very similar, but this third one has a larger eigenvalue than the second one. So these uh, two vectors are the ones that correspond to the greatest variance in the data, the directions uh, with the greatest variance. And so we can create uh, a transformation matrix by using those two vectors and then compute the data. Now it will be in two dimensions by transforming the original data with these metrics. So we are stacking these two uh, uh, vectors here, the, the first one and the, the last one. And then we use a, a matrix multiplication with the original data to obtain a transformed uh, data matrix that has as many rows as the number of points that we had, but only has two columns now. Um, so now we can plot this into dimensions and we have this result. Basically, what we're doing here is we are selecting the two vectors that correspond to the largest variance in the data. And then we are projecting the data on that plane uh, defined by those two vectors. So this way, we reduced the, the dimensions of our data from three dimensions to two dimensions. 
while preserving as much as possible of the variance in our data, so as much as possible as the dispersion. You can imagine that if we were to, for example, project along this direction here, we would have all the points uh, squeezed into a much narrower region because we would be looking along uh, this uh, long axis here. If we select the, the axis that correspond to the largest variance, then we can spread out the points as much as possible. So basically, this is PCA. It's a very uh, used technique that can uh, we can use to uh, reduce the number of dimensions while preserving as much as possible of the variance under a linear transformation. So remember that because we are selecting these vectors and then just multiplying uh, the matrices to do this, transfer, this uh, uh, transformation here, this is a linear transformation on the original data. We can imagine it to be just a rotation and then a projection. Um, so uh, this is uh, a bit limited in that sense, but it's a, a very widely used technique. It's easy to, to understand. And it's also very easy to use if you, you have uh, uh, the scikit-learn module, uh, uh, the scikit-learn library installed in the Anaconda. And there is this uh, decomposition module that has a, a PCA class. So you just need to create the PCA class uh, specifying how many dimensions you want to retain at the end, how many components. And then you use the fit method to compute the, the eigenvectors and to select the, the, the vectors uh, with this number of vectors so that you have the, the final components. And then you can use the transform method to transform whatever data you want into the lower dimensional representation. So if you want, you can use this components underscore uh, uh, attribute that will give you uh, vectors which are the, the uh, eigenvectors that uh, PCA uh, selected. So the ones that correspond to the largest variance. And doing this, it's very easy with a few lines of code. You can do PCA on your data and reduce the dimensionality. Now, the problem is that this is a linear operation on the data and it's meant just to preserve as much as possible of the variance. This may not be exactly what we want when we reduce dimensionality. So let's look at a different approach of manifold learning. And the idea here is the, uh, the um, uh, uh, manifold is a set of points uh, that uh, is in the neighborhood homeomorphic to a Euclidean space. I have a, a typo here. Uh, this is not homomorphic, but uh, um, I'll fix it later. Uh, this is the, the, um, uh, an example. You have uh, data in the surface of a sphere. Uh, for example, here we have a representation of, of seismic events on the, the surface of the Earth. This is a, a three-dimensional set of data because uh, Earth is a three-dimensional object. But we can represent this easily in two dimensions, like in, in, in any map, while locally at least preserving uh, some uh, uh, relation to these distances and preserving uh, the, uh, an approximately Euclidean space here. So uh, we cannot do that over the whole maps. If you try to draw a map of the Earth at some extremities, uh, the distances will no longer uh, work very well. For example, you have to, to loop around, uh, exit one side and enter the other, or something like that. But locally, you can draw a map that uh, uh, is faithful to the distances that are in three dimensions, even though the map is in two dimensions. So this is the idea of manifold learning, trying to find uh, this transformation for lower into lower dimensions that preserves as much as possible this topology, these uh, distance relations in the original space. Okay, so let's uh, see this hypothetical example. We have here a set of points that is spread out in three dimensions, but we can see that the, uh, they actually have a, a relation in a one dimension, which is uh, going along this line where the points are distributed. So if we could identify this, we could try to plot the, the points, for example, in one dimension and sort them according to this uh, sequence here that I'm representing in different colors. And this would be the best way of reducing dimensionality in this data set by unrolling this, uh, this thread and uh, preserving this uh, local relation between the neighboring points. 
so it could be something like this. For example, in two dimensions, we could represent it like this. Or in one dimension, we could try to keep as much as possible the ordering of this uh, uh, set of colors. Here, I'm just representing an additional coordinate uh, just to, to spread these out a bit. But uh, this would be the projection into one dimension. And if we could keep as much as possible this uh, sequence along the, this, li this line, uh, then we would preserve st uh, an important structure of the data. So one uh, algorithm that is very used for doing this, especially for visualizing high dimensional data, is uh, TSNE or T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, uh, which computes this uh, probability of one point i selecting a point j as a neighbor and basically what we do here is we consider a gaussian distribution uh, taking the distance between i and j and then we normalize that by dividing by the same uh, uh, values for all the uh, the points that uh, uh, are not j so for all the other points and basically the uh, this tells us uh, indicates a, a measure of how uh, likely is that uh, uh, one point will select another as neighbors based on the distance to that point and the distance to all the other points. And this will give you uh, give us a probability distribution that then we can just, uh, uh, using this simplified estimate, we can estimate that the probability of J and I being together as neighbors will be uh, simply the average of J selecting I and I selecting J. So we average the two. Now this gives us a, a distribution of probabilities for points selecting each other as neighbors. <clears throat> and now we are going to try to create a, a, a low dimensional representation where instead of using these original coordinates X, we use some uh, transformed coordinates Y, where uh, we do the same thing, but to, to simplify uh, the, the computation, we use a T-student distribution instead of, of the Gaussian, uh, because this simplifies the optimization to get these uh, coordinates. But the idea is the same. We are also trying to estimate in this transformed space the probability of each point selecting another point as neighbors and doing the same thing here. So the general idea is that we have this distribution of probabilities for the points selecting each other as neighbors in the original uh, high dimensional space. We also have a, a, a probability distribution for points selecting each other as neighbors in the target dimensional space. And now we want to optimize this transformation between X and the representation Y, the lower dimensional uh, 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 space that we have here, such that uh, we uh, minimize the kullback leveler divergence between the two uh, distributions. Uh, basically, the kullback leveler divergence is a measure of how dissimilar the uh, two dis distributions of probabilities are. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to uh, create a transformation Y of our initial X values such that the distribution of probabilities of picking neighbors in uh, this transformed space Y is as close as possible to the distribution of probabilities of picking neighbors in uh, the original space. And what this uh, tends to do is to preserve these relations between points that are close together. For example, we have these points here in blue that are very close together and they keep this relation here uh, close together in these two lines and then uh, these points coming here. There are some breaks here. This is not, not perfect. Also, this is done stochastically. Uh, if you run this knee several times, you get different uh, results, but it preserves much of these stretches in the correct uh, uh, topology. So by putting the points together when they are uh, likely to be neighbors. Also, if we reduce to one dimension, this is the representation here, uh, so this is reducing from three dimensions to two or from three dimensions to one here. This representation is just to spread out the points so that they are not all overlapping. But we can see that many stretches of the original line here of this uh, three dimensional thread have been preserved in this uh, uh, transformation. So this knee is a good way of uh, doing this uh, embedding, this projection into lower dimensions 
while preserving uh, most of the, the topology of the original data. Another algorithm for this is uh, Isomap, which uh, works by creating this graph. So this, you can imagine it as a, a diagram connecting uh, points to their neighbors. And uh, sorry, the neighbors are selected uh, by using the k nearest neighbors in the original space. So for each point here in the original space, we could select the number of, of neighbors that are the points that are closest together. And now we can uh, create this diagram where each point is connected to its neighbors and the, the, the edge, the connecting line between the points is the Euclidean distance measured in the original space. So you can imagine here a web between the, the, the closest points here, connecting all of these points along this line because it's only connecting the points to those that are closer uh, to itself. And now when we measure the distances between points, Instead of measuring the distances directly, for example, between the point here and a point there by measuring the distance here uh, uh, in a straight line, we would measure along the neighbors uh, that we collected. So the distance between this point and that point would be measured along this line of close neighbors. This means that these points are actually considered to be very far apart and not uh, that close together. So this gives us a, a, a pairwise a set of pairwise distances between the points and then using those distances a low dimensional embedded embedding is computed that uh, will try to respect as much as possible those distances in the lower dimensional projection but since these distances are not measured across space but uh, uh, stepping uh, uh, over the the different neighbors so going along the the neighborhoods this will preserve the uh, the structure of the data that we have here so here you can see projecting this data from three dimensions to two dimensions we have this uh, uh, line here this part of the data well preserved here in this straight line and then we have some uh, some distortion here but we can still see that the points that are close together in this line in three dimensions are still close together in two dimensions and even in one dimension most of the the correct ordering is preserved there is some overlap uh, here but most of the correct ordering of the uh, original thread is preserved so basically uh, the idea here is that we are uh, projecting the data from a higher dimensional space into a lower dimensional space but we're trying to keep as much as possible the the relations between the points and the the structure of the data and you can see that doing this with pca which just chooses the directions with the largest uh, variance is not good does not have this effect because you see the the projection this is a linear projection that will now put all these points uh, overlapping even though they are uh, quite distant in the the original space uh, tsni and isomap and, and algorithms like those are better at preserving uh, that structure so basically nonlinear dimensionality reduction works best than pca and there are many other examples self-organizing maps autoencoders and so on in scikit learn you also have lots of different uh, embedding uh, algorithms implemented that you can uh, experiment with but this uh, this idea of manifold learning is to try to uh, retain as much as possible the this these relations between the original points and retain them in the, the projected data, in the lower dimensional representation. Okay, so another area of unsupervised learning is clustering. Uh, the idea of clustering is to group similar examples together. We have some idea of what makes examples similar. So in this case, it could be merely the distance between them, uh, these points in the coordinates. And we can see that these points seem to be grouped into uh, three different groups here. And this is the kind of thing that we want to identify in data. Even though we don't have labels for classes, we are not trying to predict uh, some target value that we uh, have observed in the training set or something like that. We still want to understand that our data has some uh, peculiarities in the distribution, some, some features there that we can extract by uh, looking at the, the relation between the examples. So what we need is to have some measure of similarity of, or difference or dissimilarity or distance, something like that, that allows us to measure 
uh, this uh, between clusters and within clusters, between examples, so that we can group things that are similar together and keep apart those that are different. So basically, we can uh, uh, we are going to try to minimize the differences or maximize the similarities of examples in the same cluster. And then we're going to maximize this or minimize the similarities of examples that are in different clusters. Uh, and so clustering always requires some measure of uh, similarity or difference. The reason for doing this is to help understand data and uh, relations between the different examples. Uh, phylogenetic trees are one example of clustering. In this case, they are hierarchical clustering. But uh, you can see that it's very useful to understand how these different elements relate to each other. And in general, grouping things together is one way we use to understand uh, data. So it make, helps us make sense of complex data, of, uh, of large data sets, identify relations, and so on. We can also use uh, this to reduce data to relevant examples. Sometimes we, we need to simplify the data set and uh, use only representatives of the different groups instead of having to look at everything at once. Uh, so this is a, an early example of uh, clustering, this uh, drawing of Darwin uh, about the, the tree of life. And you can see that this is an example of hierarchical clustering where you have some examples grouped together here, others grouped here, others grouped here, and then we form groups of groups as we go uh, increasing here. Um, <clears throat> but one, one question that we can have when we are trying to cluster data is how we're going to define the clusters. Uh, for example, if we consider these uh, data points, are they separated into two clusters or perhaps three clusters or four clusters, five clusters? We can uh, consider different numbers of clusters and different criteria for deciding when they belong to the same cluster or not. So usually there are some some decisions that we need to make when we are clustering data in order to be able to then uh, generate the clusters and to understand what the, the results are. So one thing that we need to uh, uh, decide if we're going to do partitional clustering, which would be uh, all uh, data divided into groups at the same level, or if we need hierarchical clustering. We saw hierarchical clustering in the context of phylogenetic trees, where it makes sense because we're trying to capture evolutionary relations, and we know that uh, current day organisms descend from common ancestors in the past and so on. So in that case, creating this tree of groups with subgroups makes sense. In other cases, it may not make uh, sense to do hierarchical clustering. So uh, we can use partitional clustering and divide everything at the same level. So this would be an example of partitional clustering where we have five clusters, uh, but this could be a hierarchical clustering where we have two major clusterings, green and red, and then red is divided into three subclusters, the, the squares, the hexagons, and the, the circles here. And these triangles pointing in different direction would be two subclusters of the green cluster. So we can uh, uh, cluster the same data hierarchically or partitionally, and this is usually a decision that we have to, to make. Uh, we, can, we also need to decide how do, to assign membership to each cluster. Uh, ex in exclusive clustering, each example only belongs to one cluster. So we have here uh, uh, these two examples be belong to the, the triangles pointing up clusters, this one to the cluster of triangles pointing down, and so on. But we can have uh, overlapping clusters, clusters belonging to more than one cluster, and they can have fractional membership. For example, with fuzzy clustering, we assign uh, examples to clusters with uh, a value ranging from 0 to 1, so they can uh, be fractionally attributed to different clusters. With the probability clustering, it's uh, the same idea, but it's a probability of belonging to a cluster. So the sum of the membership for all the, the examples must be 1, because we are assuming that they must belong to, to some cluster. Uh, so we can consider membership in different ways, whether discrete or continuous. We also can uh, decide whether we want a complete clustering. We want to assign all examples to clusters or partial clustering, where some examples are unassigned. This is often used when we want to discard outliers or noise or things like that, and those are left out uh, from the clusters. 
So we can represent clusters with uh, uh, prototype-based clustering by choosing some prototypes that are representative of the clusters. For example, here we can choose these points marked with the crosses to determine to which cluster a point belongs. And the point will belong to the closest to a prototype in this case. So everything that is in this region will belong to this blue cluster, everything in this region to this uh, brown cluster here, and everything here to this orange uh, part. So we could uh, use these prototypes to decide in which cluster to put each point. Other ways of doing this would be looking at contiguity. So we are uh, we are creating a, a network of uh, relations between these points uh, and we are uh, assigning the, the points to clusters depending on the network they belong so that they belong to uh, clusters with points that are closest to them. Um, this would work differently if we were to create a prototype. For example, if we were to put a prototype here and a prototype here, then these points would belong to this cluster and these points would belong to this cluster and it would give a, a strange result. So uh, in, in cases like this, it's better to use other types of, of criteria for assigning clusters. And one possibility is to define the cluster based on the contiguity of these uh, uh, neighborhood relations. Other possibility is to use density. For, uh, in density-based clustering, we consider high-density regions to form clusters. And low-density regions, the, ones, uh, the points represented in black here, we can discard as noise. So in this case, it's not a complete clustering. We are putting some points, leaving some points outside. So basically, the, the important message here is that when you're doing clustering, it's important to think about what algorithm you're using because uh, this will uh, include all the criteria for defining what what clusters you're going to get, how the clusters are determined, and this may be important for the, the work that you're doing. Uh, so basically, you need some measure of uh, uh, similarity or distance to compare examples. You need to decide how to uh, assign the, the examples to cluster. If you're going to uh, assign all of them, uh, if you're going to uh, assign them partially or fully and so on, you're going to decide how the clusters are defined, if they are defined by some prototypes and then everything that is close to the prototype belongs to that cluster, if it's by density, by some sort of affinity, uh, contiguity and so on. And uh, uh, usually you need to have some way of evaluating uh, if the clusters make sense, if they are significant. Uh, and so this is not uh, trivial to do because you don't have the correct answers. You know, you don't know, you don't have labels like in, in classification where you can just measure the error. This is the, uh, the purpose here is to try to make data more intelligible, more useful. And that should be what informs uh, all of these decisions depending on the, the application. So one, the big difference between clustering and classification that we saw previously is although in both cases we are splitting the data into partitioned into different groups, uh, when we are doing classification, we have the labels in the training set. So we know when we are getting the groups right or wrong and we can measure this error and do supervised learning. In clustering, we do not have this uh, uh, prior information about which examples should be in the same group or not. So the defining uh, the, the way to do clustering is a, a, a lot harder and a lot more uncertain. And basically in clustering, the, these categories are something that the model will give us and not something that we have in the data. Uh, so you can imagine this to be analogous to classification, but the classes are created during training and when fitting the model. Uh, this means that uh, assessing uh, if clusters are right or wrong is much harder to do than in the case of classification, and you should always take care to uh, try to look carefully at the results to see if they make sense. Okay, so let's uh, look at one uh, algorithm for clustering. Actually, the algorithm itself is Lloyd's algorithm, the algorithm for computing the clustering, but this is called k-means clustering mm -hmm. because uh, we define a set of uh, 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 number k. This will be the number of clusters that we're going to find. And uh, uh, the algorithm will 
give us uh, the centroids or the, the mean points of the clusters uh, with this number of points and each example in our data will then belong to the cluster for which the, the centroid is closer to that example. So this will be a partitional clustering. All these clusters are at the same level. There are no subclusters. Uh, it's exclusive. Each point only belongs to one cluster. It's complete uh, because all the points will be assigned to clusters and prototype based because these centroids act as representatives, as prototypes for the clusters, defining where the clusters are. And the, the algorithm is basically start with some random uh, distribution of centroids, then assign each example in our data to the closest centroid and update the position of the centroids so that each of these prototypes, is each of these centroids, is at the mean point of its cluster. And then after doing this, we reassign, we recompute the assignment and we repeat until convergence. So this is, is best if we see it uh, visually. First, we need to initialize the algorithm. We, we define, we choose a number of points, uh, k, and we start uh, with uh, um, these k centrides randomly distributed. One possibility is to just to choose uh, at random a set of examples, for example, like this. We pick a, a, a set of examples here to initialize our centroids. Another is to assign at random the examples to different um, to different uh, uh, classes. So here we have assigned uh, the examples to k different uh, groups, and now we compute each centroid in the center of the um, each of the group. So the difference is that when we take uh, examples at random. We start with the centroids very uh, spread out across our data. If we do this uh, random partition initialization, where we uh, assign at random points to different groups and then compute the centroid at the center of uh, at the mean point of each group, the the centroids tend to start close together uh, near the center of the cloud of points that we have. But this is called the random partition initialization. This is the Forgy uh, initialization. We start with a random set of examples as the initial coordinates. Uh, in the random partition initialization, we already start with uh, some groups computed. Now we compute the centroid positions and now we recompute the assignment of the, the, the points to all the clusters. In the case of Forgy initialization, we start with the coordinates of the, the centroids, and then we compute the assignment by assigning each point to the closest centroid uh, uh, for uh, the, the cluster. So each point will belong to the cluster corresponding to the closest centroid. Okay, so now this is uh, the, uh, the algorithm, Lloyd's algorithm for computing k-means. We initialize uh, our centroids, we assign the, the points to the different groups depending on the distance to the centroid. For example, all of these blue squares here are closer to the blue square centroid, so they all belong to this group. All of these triangles are closer to this triangle than any other centroid, so they belong to uh, this triangle group and so forth. And now that we did the assignment, we are going to compute the mean point of each group and we're going to shift the centroids there. For example, the mean point of this group of squares is here, and so the centroid for the squares cluster will move in this direction, the, the triangle will move here, the, the circle will move here, and so on. So after we do this, we recompute the cluster assignments. And now some points changed membership because uh, they uh, are now closer to a different centroid since the centroids moved. And now we repeat, compute the mean uh, of the uh, each group, we update the centroids, we update the assignment, and we keep doing this until there is no more change. So eventually we reach a stage where the points do not change membership, the, the centroids do not move, and so the algorithm stops. There is no, no change here. And this is how we can uh, De uh, define five clusters with these points by moving the five centroids to the different positions using uh, this uh, algorithm. Note that the number of centroids is predefined in the k-means algorithm, so the user has to decide how many centroids to use, but then 
uh, where they will end up and uh, what groups will uh, appear. That is what the algorithm will determine. So if you wanted to implement this uh, yourself, all we needed to do was to create a function to get the closest centroids uh, given a set of data points. So this is a matrix where each point is a row and each coordinate is a column. And this would be the matrix with uh, all our centroids. So we are going to, for each point in our data, we are going to compute the distances to all uh, the, the centroids. So between this point and all the centroids in this matrix of, uh, of centroid points. And uh, we are going to assign to uh, this label, this uh, vector of labels, the index of the centroid that corresponds to the smallest distance to this point ix. And we're going to do this for all the points. So basically what this loop does is for each point in our data set, pick the centroid that is closest to that point and returns a vector with the indexes of the centroids for all the points in our data. Now, after we have this, we can adjust the, the position of the centroid. So we find which centroid is closer to uh, each point in our data. And now we recompute the position of the centroid to be the mean of the points that belong to that particular centroid. So we select from our data those points that have this uh, label, this uh, cluster label, and we compute the mean point for all those coordinates. And this will be the new coordinate for the centroid. So basically this is assigning the, the points to the centroids, which we do here, and then recomputing the position of the centroid. And this gives us these steps as we move along the algorithm and keep changing the position of the centroids and updating the membership of uh, the points. So now we can do the initialization. The 4G method would be simply to uh, select with reposition a number of points from our data. So we can get uh, a set of indexes that go from zero to uh, the number of rows in our data. We shuffle that so that we have the indexes in a random order. And now we take the coordinates corresponding to the, to the first k indexes here. Note that this is slightly different from what we did in bootstrapping, uh, for, because in bootstrapping, we are doing sampling with reposition. So we just pick at random and we don't care if there are repetitions. In this case, we do not want repetitions. We want to select k points at random, but without repetitions. So we first create these indexes and then we shuffle the indexes. This means that the first k indexes that we have will be a random set of indexes, but there will be no repetition because they are just the original ones shuffled. Uh, another way of doing this would be with random partition. In this case, we are assigning at random the, the points to classes. So we create these labels by uh, randomly assigning each point to one of the k uh, groups that we have. And in this case, this is sampling with reposition because there will be more than one point assigned to, to each group. And now we uh, compute the centroids by just taking the mean of the points that belong to that particular group. So this would be a, a simplified way of doing random partition initialization. This would be initialization by the Fargi method, the two methods that we saw here. Uh, then what we need is to um, define, when we are doing k-means, define the k and usually define a, a distance measure. Typically, we can use Euclidean distance. Uh, this is the most uh, uh, widely used, most common one. But we can, we can define different distance measures. And in general, the Minkowski distance would be the p root of the uh, sum of the the module of the differences between the coordinates raised to p. So in Euclidean distance, p is 2, and we have the square root of the sum of the square differences. Uh, this is what uh, we usually do when we compute distances. But you can use, for example, Manhattan distance, which has a p of 1, uh, or other uh, kinds of distance uh, that you want. So this would be the general distance measure, uh, Minkowski distance. Uh, there is a variant of k-means. Sometimes 
we cannot do this. Sometimes we have um, um, a measure of distance between the examples, but we cannot compute a mean point. Uh, for example, suppose that your examples were not coordinates, but were sequences. We could measure the different distance between sequences by measuring some kinds of, of differences between them, but we cannot really compute a mean sequence out of a, a, a number of sequences. There is no average sequence that we can compute. So in that case, we cannot compute the means, but we can use this variant, k midoids, which instead of, of using this centroid, which is a mean point, it uses a, a midoid, which is a particular example in our data set, and it chooses the one that is most similar to uh, all the others in the cluster. So basically, we assign each example uh, in a cluster to the, the midoid that is most similar. And now for each cluster, we are going to test if there is an example that is, is better, that works better as a representative of the cluster, as the midoid, by checking the distances to all the examples. So it works similarly to k-means, but we, are not, we do not have to compute the mean point we can uh, use the, the midoid like that. Another uh, algorithm for uh, clustering that uses a very different approach is dbscan, which is density-based spatial clustering. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, this considers that each point has a, a, a neighborhood epsilon. So this is a, a distance. And the neighborhood of each point is the set of all points within that distance. And uh, a point is a core point if it has at least this number of points in this neighborhood. So epsilon, uh, the neighborhood distance, and the minimum number of points are parameters that we can specify when we want to run dbscan. So a core point is a point that has at least this number of points within its epsilon neighborhood. Uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, basically, the algorithm considers if a point is reachable uh, from another, if it's in the neighborhood, or if there is a path, there is a set of neighbors that we can find uh, that go from one to the other. And uh, all the points that are reachable one to, to the other will belong to the same cluster. So the way the algorithm works is we're going to visit each point in our data set. And if the number of neighbors uh, epsilon in the neighborhood epsilon of that point is less than the minimum number of points, then we presume that this point is just noise. It's in a low, di low density region, so it does not belong to any cluster. If not, if it's uh, uh, at least minimum number of points, then this point will be a core point, and so we create a cluster uh, for this point. And now, for each point in the neighborhood of point P, we uh, either add this point in the neighborhood to the same cluster of P, or if this point already belongs to, to a cluster, then we merge the two clusters together. So basically, we are visiting a, 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 all the points. We are merging together the points that uh, uh, belong to, to clusters, and if they are in the same neighborhood. And we are creating clusters for all the points that are core clusters. That is, they are in a high density region because they have a larger number of neighbors. And we are leaving out those points that are in very low density regions. So the result is something like this. If you apply dbscan to this data set, you are going to find some core points here. But since they have uh, common neighbors, then these will all be merged into a single cluster. The same thing will happen with these green points here. As we find that there are core points here, but we find that they share neighbors, they end up all uh, being merged into the same cluster. But then we have these points here that are in black that do not belong to any cluster. They are in low density regions. And so this is not a complete uh, clustering. And also these two clusters, the blue and the, and the green, are not merged together because there is no connection between them. We are not going to find uh, points that are simultaneously in the neighborhood of blue and green points here. So uh, density-based clustering solves some problems that you have with prototype clustering if the shapes are very irregular, but it uh, needs uh, to have uh, different densities in order to uh, figure out what the clusters are. 
So note that core points are not really prototypes. It's not one prototype uh, that attracts everything there, but it's a series of points that form this contiguous neighborhood here, and that uh, merges all of these uh, points together in the same cluster. If you want to use uh, dbscan with scikit-learn, this is uh, uh, very simple. You have this uh, dbscan uh, class here. So basically you define the parameters and then you uh, uh, fit with uh, uh, the data. The same thing for k-means. You also have a k-means class in scikit-learn. So you, you don't actually need to implement these algorithms. They are readily available in these libraries. Okay, so to sum up, we saw this idea of unsupervised learning. We are not trying to approximate some target labels. We, we don't need those target labels for unsupervised learning, but we are doing things with the data to help us understand the data or extract more useful features. One example of this is dimensionality reduction, where we want to compress our features into a lower dimension while preserving as much as possible of the information. And manifold learning is a good way of doing this because it tries to preserve the relations between the points when we pass into a lower dimensional uh, representation. This is something that PCA, for example, is not able to do. And then we saw two approaches to clustering. Uh, Prototype-based clustering with k-means, where we define how many clusters we want and the algorithm, Lloyd's algorithm, determines where these uh, centroids will be placed uh, this number of centroids will be placed, and then the points are assigned to the closest centroid. And we also saw density-based clustering with dbscan. In this case, we do not decide in the beginning what number of clusters we will have. We decide those parameters, minimum points, and the, the epsilon, the radius of the neighborhood. And these will influence the number of clusters, but we do not choose the number of clusters. And then dbscan assigns points to clusters by looking at the density in those neighborhoods. Points that are in high density regions will belong to clusters. If there is a network of points that are neighbors of one another, all of those will be merged into the same cluster. And points that are in low density regions will not be assigned to cluster. Uh, they will be considered noise.